Hello everyone, we are doing module 1 introduction to parallel architectures. This is lecture number 7 and in this lecture we are going to see a shift from sequential to parallel. Up to previous uh, lecture we have seen uh, performance, speed up, execution time, how to report the results. We have looked at Amdahl's law, Gustafson's law and so on. Uh, the conclusion was that we need parallel architectures and today we will again uh, reinforce uh, this understanding and look at how we move from sequential to parallel. All right. So, we are building parallel systems, but why? Uh, because the single processor performance can no longer be sustained. Earlier, it was uh, defined with the transistor density, that is the processor performance improved with the transistors, with the number of instructions you could execute, the development in the instruction set architecture, the processor speed, and then instruction level parallelism. All these factors improved the single processor performance. However, we uh, saw that the frequency could not be increased beyond a point because of power constraints, because of heat issues and so on. So, the chips became too hot to be usable. The limits of heat dissipation had reached and we could not increase the clock frequency. And therefore, to increase the number of uh, or rather to increase the usage of these transistor density, we thought of add adding parallelism and going multicore. Okay. And we have seen some examples in the previous lectures and this slide also lists uh, some newer uh, processors which are multi-core from 6 cores to 70, 80 core systems exist and GPUs definitely have several more processing elements. So, what are the consequences of this multi-core revolution on computing? I would say the easy times have gone. Why? Because in the single core system, we had uh, better performing applications just because the processor was good. I had a good ISA, a good frequency, nice ILP given to me by the computer architecture and the same program ran very fast. But now this easy uh, way is not possible. Just updating myself or just updating my processor to a newer generation is not going to automatically improve the performance for us. And parallel computing techniques need to be exploited uh, with every newer generation because we have every new generation is coming with more cores. Thus, the parallel computing is going mainstream. All right. So, why do we need to write parallel programs? All right, I have a multi-core system, but can't I use it the same way I used to use a single core system? All right. So, programs uh, that were written for a conventional single core systems cannot exploit the multiple cores because the program was compiled keeping in mind that you have a single core, it has a specific ISA, instructions are scheduled in a particular manner and hence it only sees a single core, no matter your program is running on a multi-core system. Okay. So, that program on a single core cannot simply exploit the multiple cores. Uh, we could do one thing that run multiple programs on the, these different cores, that is multiple instances of the same program is one way out, but does this help us? Uh, of course, I can run different programs on the multiple cores, but if I want to improve the performance of a particular application, I need to exploit the multiple cores for this particular application. Okay. Um, for example, you are writing a gaming application. Would you want to have multiple instances of the game run on the same processor or you want the gaming software to perform better? Right? Definitely you want your game to run faster rather than run multiple games on different cores of the same system. Okay. So, how do we do this? Rewrite single programs to go parallel uh, so that we can exploit the multiple cores. That is we need to rewrite the sequential program into a parallel one. Can this be automated? Yes, uh, it can be to a certain extent, but it is not always possible. There has been limited success in auto translation of serial code to parallel code because it is not very straightforward to identify complex constructs in a serial program because all our serial programs are becoming more complex and it is difficult to identify the constructs which can be uh, chopped into small pieces to be run in parallel. Okay, so, what do we do? Step back and devise newer algorithms for a parallel system. We have seen this example in the uh, vector architecture, but a quick recap to understand the concept. If you want to sum uh, the elements in an array in a sequential manner, what will you do? Okay, so, this is my array, uh, may have 1000, 100, oh, how many ever uh, elements to be added. So, I will just take the first element and add this element to the second one. 
So first do this pair of addition, then this result gets added to the second one, sorry to the third element. And then we take the fourth element and then add the fourth element to the sum of the previous. You getting it? So, this is how I would do this on a sequential or a serial manner adding two elements at a time and accumulating the sum in the uh, previous one. So, this is the same sum getting accumulated. So, we are going to uh, accumulate the answer and at the end of all this journey here is where you will get the final answer. Okay, so, the final sum will come here. So, you can see there is a cascade of all these operations uh, sequentially done one after the other to compute the sum in series. The same thing if you want to do in parallel, what will you do? I will chop the data into small pieces and then give that work to different multi cores, right? Every core will do the addition and every core definitely has to do a sequential addition similar to the previous one. So, it does this and uh, this way ok. So, this is sum S1 and similarly here you will get through a tree of additions you will get an S2, S3 and S4 ok. Eventually our job will be to add these ok. So, to find some of the elements in parallel, I will chop the work across multiple cores. In this example, I have taken more smaller pieces, every piece having only uh, two elements at a time. So, only two elements, two elements here, two elements here. Uh, so, the blue uh, range of elements gives me this yellow range of elements, which is the sum of uh, pairs of uh, the numbers. Then we add the two uh, yellow ones to get the pink one and then we add the pink ones to get the green one and then the uh, blue one, which is the last one. All right. So, with this tree structure, uh, we are able to generate the final answer. So, what lesson do we learn from this example? Uh, that is the sum of uh, elements of an array. So, it is tough for a translator to discover the procedure. Okay. Certain softwares are able to identify the common serial constructs and parallelize them. However, uh, with increasing complex serial applications and serial programs, it is difficult to auto translate or auto divide these programs. So, therefore, we cannot continue to write serial programs, we must write parallel programs to exploit the multiple cores. So, how do we write parallel programs? This was an example, but uh, is there a proper method to do this. So, to write a parallel program you have to divide the task and dividing the task comes under two different types, one is task parallelism and one is data parallelism. So, you have to divide the tasks across the processors or you have to divide the data across processors ok. So, let us uh, do this with an example ok. So, uh, the example is uh, about checking answer books after an examination. So, we have professor P and the professor has got 4 TAs A, B, C and D ok. So, there are 5 uh, uh, resource people to do the job and what is the task to be done? We have 100 answer books to check and each having 5 questions ok. Uh, so, we have how many resources? We have 5 resources and what is the task? we have to check questions, 5 questions and there are how many answer books? 100 ok, uh, sorry 100 answer books. So, this questions I can say I have question 1, question 2, 3, 4 and 5, I have 5 questions to check. So, we have a stack of answer books kept here to be checked. So, several answer books are there and each answer book has got 5 questions to check. So, how do you divide the task? One option is task parallel. So, what is task parallel? You have to define what a task means in your current problem statement. So, it is up to us how we define it uh, because at times there could be multiple options available. In this case, I will say that every question is a task for me ok. So, task is question wise. So, each question is one task. So, how many tasks do we have in this uh, application? We have 5 tasks in this application and I can give one task to every resource. So, if with this definition what will you do? 
you will give question 1 to resource 1, question 2 to resource person 2 and so on. Okay. So, what does this mean? When resource person 1 gets question 1, this person is going to check question 1 of all the answer books starting from 1 to 100. So, they will check book 1 question 1, book 2 question 1 and so on. So, resource person 1 is going to check question 1 of all the answer books, resource person 2 will do question 2 of all the answer books and so on. So, this is how we can exploit task level parallelism. Now, I think you must have uh, already concluded what would be data parallelism in this example. Okay? So, you can pause the video, think for yourself if you have not uh, decided the method. All right. So, what is uh, remaining? What is the other way of thinking? We have these answer books. right? So, for data parallelism, I can use the answer books. We have 100 answer books and if I treat the answer books as data. Okay? So, if I treat this as data, I have to divide the data across 5 resource persons and how are we going to do that? I will say my data is the answer book and this answer book has to be uh, distributed across the resource persons. So, R1 will get 20 books and so on resource person 5 will get the remaining or last 20 books. So, every resource person gets 20 books to check and when they get the 20 books, they do the complete question set. So, question 1 to question 5, all questions are checked by the same resource person on this set of data. So, we have divided the data parallelly across the resources and every resource is doing the complete program execution that is checking question 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 on his or her set of data. So, that is data parallelism. Okay. So, task parallelism give one question each to a resource person and data parallelism give 20 answer books to every resource person to check. Okay. So, that is how one can think of uh, moving from a serial to a parallel and dividing the tasks. So, in theory, um, can we evaluate how fast we will go? So, on the left hand side, um, I have uh, given an example. If you want to sum n numbers, okay. so summing n numbers, so, to add n numbers on a sequential uh, machine, you will need order n complexity. You, are, you want to add uh, pairs at a time where only one number can be handled in one uh, time unit. Okay, so, order n, n is the complexity of adding n numbers. You want to sort n numbers? Yes, you are going to take order n log n time on a sequential machine. Now, the same task if I want to do in a parallel machine, if you see here, the previous slide had an example, we drew a tree and the tree uh, height was log n. So, that would uh, decide the time complexity. So, time to sum n numbers was log n uh, in a parallel system where n is the number of uh, processors available. Sorry, n is the number of uh, numbers you want to add. Okay. Then time to sort n numbers. Uh, well, if we think I want to just divide this by n, it is not actually log n, but the best we could get is log n. So, that is in theory, but in practice we are not going to get such a good speed up. Why? Because in practice there are many constraints we need to follow because first thing is we need to uh, define how the data is distributed across the processors. Right? We are going to divide the workload and so the data will be given to different cores. How is the data going to be named in this? Then how are the processors going to communicate with each other, coordinate and synchronize with each other? So, these are the problems we need to handle. Then selecting the processing node size, how big a processing node I should uh, select, should it be a complete uh, personal computer or can it be a small ALU or a small streaming multiprocessor like in a GPU. So, what is the size of my processing element and how many such processing nodes I need to have in my system. So, theory, I can say that I can theoretically get this much speed up, but in practice all these questions need to be answered. So, if we look at the same example here uh, of adding n numbers in parallel. So, my first question was name of the data across processors and communication values. So, name of the data that is this was my array A 
of i and uh, this array was stored in some memory in a sequential system. When I uh, chop the data across multiple processors, these two items, where are they stored? Are they stored in registers? How are they copied from the main memory? Do it, uh, do they move to a local memory? Are they cached? Can they be only loaded in registers and so on? Okay, so, there are many questions to be answered when we chop the data. Then communicating values. Okay. So, for communicating values, once this answer, yellow answer is ready, these two yellow circles, we need to communicate these two yellow circles to some processing element which can do the addition to generate the pink answer. So, this value has to be transmitted. So, I need to transmit this value from a particular processor. So, suppose this was P5 and P6, these were two processors. So, from P5, I need to send the value to P6 or vice versa. So, whoever has taken the responsibility of adding, uh, we will have to transmit the local answer to that processor. So, a communication is required to do this. Then coordination and synchronization. All right. So, what does this mean? When uh, the pink circle, that is the pink answer will be generated only when the two yellows are ready. Okay? So, I have yellow 1 and yellow 2, we add them to get pink 1. Okay? Suppose this is the uh, structure. Now, how do we know when to start the addition? That is, when is y1 and y2 ready? Are these values ready to be added? Who will tell this to us? Will processors P5 and P6 tell or we have to find that out that is when is Y1 and Y2 ready. So, all that that is called coordination and synchronization we need to establish that before we can generate the pink answer. Okay. Then you want to select the size of the processing element. In my particular example I had just need to add so I need an adder. Okay. And depending on the precision of the element, I will need a 4 bit adder and all the way to 64 bit adder. Okay. So, we will need an adder of one of these sizes depending on the uh, data type. But if I want to do a multiplication, I will need a multiplier. If I want to do several complex arithmetic operations, I might need a ALU. Even further, for example, you are doing some signal processing or something, you will need a more complex core. So, what type of processing node do you need from a few bits ALU to or do you need a complete processor? And then selecting the number of nodes in the system. So, which is the best way or how many cores do I need to solve this problem? 5, 10, 100. Okay? So, that decision has to be done. All right? So, we saw here that writing sequential programs is not sufficient. You need to rethink and design parallel programs, but parallel programs do not come for free. You need to keep track of uh, all these factors when you write parallel programs and uh, we will see in the future lectures how do we establish or give answers to these questions. Okay? Thank you. Mm -hmm.